Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're in a series called Life Well Lived on the Sermon on the Mount. We'll be in it for some months to come. We're taking our time as we work our way through the beginning of the sermon, the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived. And we are working our way through these statements of happiness and blessedness, which uh, the Lord um, says belongs to those who live a kingdom lifestyle and those who belong to the kingdom. We're looking at verse 5 today, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, a message I've called a quiet strength, because that's what meekness is. It's a quiet strength. It's power under control, and we will make that clear as we go along. Let's take time to read the uh, the, the Beatitudes here in verses 1 through 12 with a, an eye on verse 5. Would you take your copy of God's Word and stand simply in honor of God's Word as a, a symbol uh, that we have arrived at a particular moment in our service where we are about to hear the voice of God through the Word of God, speaking sufficiently and with complete authority on all matters of faith and practice. Matthew 5 verse 1, Jesus is Uh, uh, Matthew is speaking here about the, the Sermon on the Mount. And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So reads God's word. You may be seated. Imagine the company you work for, and they're looking for a new CEO, and to help in the process, they have printed and posted a a job description of the kind of man or woman they're looking for. Question, do you think that meekness would be at the top of the list? Imagine a local or a state or federal election. Then imagine the person running for office with this slogan, Vote for me, for I am meek and lowly. Or what about a search committee at a church seeking to find the next pastor who's going to raise up the next generation? Do you think that the number one priority is to find the meekest person available to lead? Look, the reality is that in these three cases and scenarios, that's not a reality. Most of the time, that's not true. The prevailing opinion of our culture and even the church is that blessed are the strong, the assertive, the dynamic, the powerful. And if the meek have any role, it's simply to support the strong. I don't know if you need me to tell you. I think you know this yourself by experience and instinct. Meekness is not a virtue celebrated in the modern world. The world doesn't believe that the meek shall inherit the earth. Bobby Knight, the late uh, basketball coach, was famous for saying, the meek may well inherit the earth, but they rarely get the rebounds. The famous uh, industrialist, J. Paul Getty, said the meek may inherit the earth, but they won't get the mineral rights. Now, you and I believe, live in a world that believes that the assertive, bordering on the arrogant, it is that kind of person that inherits the earth. Life tells us the nice guys come in last. The world believes that the meek suffer more because they're a doormat for others to wipe their feet on. 
The earth belongs to the strong, the successful type. Life is a jungle, so you'd better be a tiger type with a carnivore instinct. It's a dog-eat-dog world out there, so eat or be eaten. In fact, the whole idea of meekness stinks of weakness, and we don't like it. In fact, in his book, Unlike uh, Happiness in Unlikely Places, Don McCulloch says this, meekness, let's admit it, we don't like the word, it tastes insipid, smells like morning wash, mouthwash, and, and, and li- looks like Casper milk, milk toast. It has the strength of a cooked noodle. Coaches don't rally teams with it. Executives don't sell seals people in the, into the field with it. Politicians don't promise to lead by it. Parents don't counsel children to develop it. Generals don't embolden troops with it. You don't find anyone offering seminars on meekness training. It probably should be examined by the House Committee on on American Activities and Attitudes. I think that's where we're at. and, And that's why, given that mindset, the reality of the third beatitude comes as a surprise. It did then and it does nigh. These words can ajar, don't they? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Our experience seems otherwise. Just to fill in background, um, the words of Jesus here are an echo from the Old Testament in Psalm 37, verses 10 and 11. King David says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. What is considered a vice in the world of man is considered a virtue in the kingdom of God. So we should be all ears. We've already established that uh, this sermon is counter-cultural. Look at the language of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus sets the values of the kingdom and those who belong to it in contrast to the pagan world, to the surrounding culture. He talks about the pagans and what they do, and we don't follow their example. He, He says several times, you have heard it said, You know what the prevailing opinion is on that, but I say to you. And even at the end of that sermon, he'll set before us two paths, one broad with many on it, one narrow with few on it, and one leads to life and the other leads to destruction. Jesus is constantly setting a contrast between what the child of God ought to be and what the citizen of the world is. The kingdom of God doesn't fit in. It invades. It combats prevailing norms, acceptable ethics, godless thoughts, humanistic values, and common assumptions. In God's kingdom, under God's rule, you don't have the survival of the fittest. You have the triumph of the meekest. High startling, high strange. Now, as we come to look at this um, Beatitude, the third, there's three things we're going to look at. We've applied this to each Beatitude so far, and we'll continue that pattern. The meaning, the means, the mercy. What What is meekness? And how does one possess it and practice it? And what is the promise to those who indeed are governed by it? Let's look at the meaning Let's understand this misunderstood concept and attitude, meekness. Let's remind ourselves it is a vital virtue. It is, in fact, the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.23 says, When God works in you, what will be worked out is a lifestyle of humility and meekness. Now, before we get to what it is, will be helped by understanding what it's not, because there is a lot of confusion regarding this idea of meekness. And I want to say right out the gate, meekness is not weakness. 
A meek person isn't wishy-washy. The weak person, a meek person isn't a reed blown about by the wind. It's not a person, a man or a woman, without a brain, without brawn, without a bite. The meek are not shapeless, spineless souls who wander aimlessly through this world. No, meekness is not weakness. It is not a life without conviction or without confidence. To be meek doesn't mean you're a doormat. To be meek doesn't mean you're a quizzling. In fact, I want to remind you that Numbers 12, 3 tells us that Moses was one of the meekest men alive in his day. I want to remind you in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29, that Jesus described himself as meek and lowly of heart. Got a question. Was Moses weak? Do you see a weak man leading the people of God out of Egypt and towards the promised land? As you look at the Lord Jesus Christ who dealt with betrayal, the mockery of um, the leadership of Israel, the rejection of his own people, the political expediency of Pilate, the physical abuse prior to the cross, the cross itself, where he took that cup of wrath and drank that for us. Do you see a weak person? I don't. So just get it right. Meekness is not weakness. It's moral strength. It's inner fortitude. It's controlled responses, which takes a lot of strength. So that's what it's not. That helps us. What is it? Well, there are shades of meaning to this word, but I'm going to run with the common denominator. Meekness, simply put, and best put, is power under restraint and strength under control. It's moral strength. It's denial and direction of self. It's an inner spirit that manages one's emotional responses and governs one one's physical actions. It's not the absence of assertion, but it is the absence of self-assertion and self-absorption. In fact, the Greeks, interestingly, talked about a meek horse. This word carries the idea of a horse that's been tamed or broken, right? You've maybe been involved in some equestrian sport, or maybe you, you've had some horse riding experience, and, and you know, this, this great animal of, of natural power and strength is, has been tamed and restrained, and now it's in bit and bridle and saddle. It's not that the horse has lost any of its innate power. It's not that the horse has become weaker. It's just that the horse now, all of its power is under control, under the direction of the rider and its master. And that's our word. That's what meekness means. It's strength under control. It's restraint. In fact, there's a story that's attached to the ancient Arabs when they trained Arabian steeds for the king's stable. Their equestrian trainer carried a whistle that when it was blown... The the horse had been trained to stop and respond to the trainer by moving in the trainer's direction. Complete obedience was required, and this training went on for some time. And towards the end of the training, a final test was set before these great steeds and stallions. They weren't fed for five days, and they weren't given any uh, water for three days. So they were denied water and drink. And on the last day, troughs of grain and water were put about a hundred yards on one end of the corral. Then suddenly the corral door would spring open and the surprised horses would gallop forward. They would see the troughs filled with grain and with water. And about 25 yards from arriving at those troughs would satisfy their hunger pains and their thirst pains, the whistle would be blown. And everything about the horse would tighten. And a choice would have to be made, go to the trough or go to the trainer. 
Some went to the trough and satisfied their hunger and their thirst. But if a horse resisted its own fleshly instincts and went to the trainer, it alone qualified for the king's service and then was allowed to go to the trough. My friend, that's meekness. That's strength under control. That's the submission of our will to God's will. That's the preferring of others before yourself. And that's what we're dealing with here. The meaning of meekness is that. Now, before we look at the means, how do we possess it? How do we practice it? Um, I want you to think about this idea of um, humility, meekness, lowliness, strength under control, in, in, in three dimensions, upward, outward, inward. Upward to God. What does that look like, to be meek before God? I think it means to trust Him, to submit to Him. And the reason I would argue that, let's go back to Psalm 37, which is the antecedent, the background to our text. Jesus drew from Psalm 37 and verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth. What is the context of Psalm 37? David is writing, and he's bothered, he's fretting, he's fussing over the fact that righteousness at times doesn't pay, and wickedness is prospering in the kingdom. Evil doers are advancing. The righteous are in retreat. It's an age-old problem. Those who ought to be ought to lose are winning, and those who ought to win are losing. And, and, and David says, "Do not fret because of evil doers." Look at verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. That word commit is a Hebrew term. Roll it towards him. Beautiful, right? Whatever you've got, don't carry it. Just roll it. Commit it to him. Your children, your health, your tomorrow, your challenges. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. Verse 7, lovely. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. And then you'll see in verse 11, because the meek shall inherit the earth. And in verse 10, in a little while the wicked shall be no more. So meekness is believing that. Meekness is living that. Meekness is trusting in, resting on, delighting over God in tough circumstances, submitting to his will, trusting his plan, fighting the temptation to do it your own way. Meekness is not, meekness is not fretting in the face of evil because you know God is sovereign and you're feeding on his faithfulness. And he has promised that evil will not pay and righteousness will prevail. Trust him for vindication. Meekness is subservience to God's will. Meekness is looking to the power of God when feeling helpless and even humiliated. You know, when I was in the police in Northern Ireland, this psalm was a watering hole for me because it seemed at times that um, terrorists were winning, justice wasn't being served, and too many good men were being laid in their graves. And I had to come to this passage time and time again, frat not yourself because of evildoers. They will soon be cut off. In fact, one of the phrases that IRA supporters used against the RUC. If we were in a face-to-face confrontation with a crowd or in a riot situation, they used to use Gaelic, in Irish, old Irish language, and they'd shout, Chucky our la, which being translated means our day will come. And you know what? Some days it looked like their day was coming. Things were moving in the wrong direction time their government seemed to lack the will to win, pay the price, attached to real law and order. But I would come to Psalm 37, I'd remind myself, well, my day's coming, our day's coming, when the, the wicked will be 
cut off. And meekness is living in the in-between and trusting God and not using unrighteous methods to achieve righteous ends. That's the upward dimension. What about the, the, the outward dimension? Upward to God, trust Him, rest in Him. Outward to others. I think it means gentleness and, and kindness and maybe to borrow a word from uh, Philippians 4, 5, moderation or sweet reasonableness. Galatians 5, 23 translates this Greek word gentleness. You, you handle people with care. You, you show respect. You turn away wrath with a soft answer, Proverbs 15, verse 1. You have a humility when a brother falls. Galatians 6, 1 to 2 says what? When a brother is overtaken by a fault, you who are spiritual, what? Restore such a brother in a spirit of meekness. Lest you yourself be tempted. You don't stand over wagging a finger. You get down alongside knowing there go I but for the grace of God. And you lift that brother or sister up and you treat them in all their fragility and brokenness with kindness and patience and grace and care. It's a calm and collected response to enemies of the gospel. If you go to 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26, Paul encourages the minister of the gospel, the pastor, to, to um, act with meekness, towards those who contradict the faith. Then there's the inward dimension, upward to God, outward to others, inward to self. What, is, what does it look like for you and I to be meek? I think it is to have a true estimate of oneself in the light of one's sin, in the light of one's wretchedness, in the light of one's brokenness and desperate need of God's grace. We'll come back to this idea. Don't forget that this third beatitude grows out of one and two. Who are the meek? They are those who are poor of spirit. They're, they are those who understand they have fallen way, 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 way short of God's glory. They are not in any stretch of the imagination what God created man to be originally. We go astray in our heart. Our thoughts and imaginations are wicked. We know that. We own that. And that produces a mourning, a sense of brokenness before God, a weeping, a spirit of contrition, which leaves you what? Meek. Leaves you bowed at the cross, humbled, and marveling at God's grace. Isn't that Romans 12, 3? In the light of God's grace towards us, Paul says what? That we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this about meekness. I would define meekness like this. The man who is truly meek is the one who is amazed that God and man can think of him as well as they do and treat him as well as they do. That, it seems to me, is the essential quality. Basically, in the words of the Puritans, we're always doing better than we deserve. And when you've got that attitude, when you've got that perspective, Humility comes easier, and meekness can be something that you and I are marked by. Jerry Jenkins, co-author of the multi-million seller Left Behind series, once quipped, quote, if I ever act like I deserve this, punch me in the mouth. That's good. I like that. I, I, that's the way I need to be treated. I need just punch me in the mouth. Let, let me remind me, as, as, as I was brought up to believe, because it was repeated so often and it's kind of fallen out of our vocabulary, you know, you and I are just hell-deserving sinners who have come to be recipients of God's amazing grace. That, that, you know, meekness is the only right response on our part to what we are in Adam before we were in Christ. 
We see this grace towards others, this trust in God, this yieldedness, submission to providence, this gentle spirit, this restraint of emotion, this absorption of hurt, this proper size sense. We see it as the true meaning of meekness. And if you study the Bible, you'll find it in so many different characters. I don't have time to go through all the ones I've written in my notes, but here's a few examples. What about Moses? We identified uh, Moses as a meek person, Numbers 12, verses 1 to 3. But the context of that description of him being meek is very interesting. Miriam, his friends and his family had turned against him. They'd slandered him. And what is Moses' response? He rested in God. He rolled his burden God's way, and he didn't stoop to revenge or bitterness. In fact, in verse 13, he fell on his face and he prayed for his enemies. Talk about strength under control. What about David? But when David had the opportunity to kill Saul, remember that? David and his men were held up in a cave, being hunted by Saul and his troops. And and Saul turns aside into the cave to relieve himself. And he doesn't know that there in the shadows of the cave is David. And all of his men are nudging him. Your chance, go for it. God has delivered him into your hands, and yet David doesn't take his life. In fact, he cuts a little bit of his clothing off, doesn't he? And when Saul's at a safe distance, David shows it. And Saul looks at his tunic and realizes how close he was to death. And yet, according to 1 Samuel 26, 8 and 23, that story, David doesn't do that because he's meek. God has told him he'll be next in line, but he's willing to wait. He's willing to trust. He's willing to rest in the Lord to bring that about in his way and in his time. He doesn't go greedily grabbing what is not his yet in the providence of God. Talk about strength under control. We've talked about Jesus, meek and lowly of heart, Matthew 11, 28 to 29. Jesus dealt with the unbelief of his disciples the betrayal of Judas, the political expediency of Pilate, the rejection of the nation, the harassment of Pharisees and scribes, and then the cup of suffering on the cross. He dealt with it all with humility and meekness. He could have called 10,000 angels to end the world and set them free, but he didn't. He had made himself of no reputation. He had humbled himself. Talk about strength under control. What about John the Baptist? He was a forceful personality. He was the last of the prophets. He called the nation to repent, and that takes a strong man. Yet he showed a world passivity for the sake of exalting Christ and preferring him to himself. I'm not worthy to tie the laces of his sneakers. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. In fact, I want to tell you this, John 3.30, the sooner I decrease and the sooner he increases, the better. Talk about strength under control. He had the spotlight but he happily walked off stage. That's meekness. What about Paul in closing this thought? Paul was a man who talked a lot about meekness, but he walked the talk. He showed wonderful restraint when amidst his faithfulness to the gospel, others were unfaithful to him. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 16, regarding his first defense, In Rome, no one stood with him. They all evaporated, ran to the hills, didn't want to associate with um, Paul, who was out of favor with the Romans, lest it come their way. He was deserted, left high and dry, yet without bitterness or recrimination, he says in that same verse in 2 Timothy 4, verse 16, I pray, Lord, you won't charge it to their account. Talk about strength under control. 
Now that's the meaning. What about the means? We've defined the word. We've understood the concept. We've seen its importance. So how do we model it? How do we maintain it? Colossians 3.12 tells us to put on meekness. It's an image, right, of putting on a clothes, part of a, a piece of clothing and taking on off a piece of clothing. That's a deliberate action. That's something you've got to do at a time and a place where you deliberately put off and put on. And so it's a challenge for you to actively and me deliberately pursue putting on this virtue of meekness. My dad worked in a factory a good part of his life, and I watched him as a young boy put on his overalls in the morning, leave the house, and as soon as he came home, take off his overalls, for there was no dinner otherwise, according to mum. No dirty, stinking overalls at the dinner table. Put it off. Put on, put off. It's deliberate. It's, 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 it's something you and I have got to pursue willfully. Three things quickly here. Number one, it'll take contrition. I'm going to go back to a point I just made. The third beatitude grows out of the first and second beatitude, contrition. The spiritual attribute, the mark of kingdom life, is indeed a spirit of poverty and brokenness before God. Remember that these beatitudes um, are progressive. They're not a bag of marbles all loosely held together. They're a pearl necklace that come in order. Poverty of spirit leads to mourning, which produces meekness, right? If you and I are poor in spirit, it means we understand that we have nothing to offer God. We're in his debt. We are under his wrath. We are in a desperate state. And we we own own our bankruptcy, our indebtedness, and our need for mercy. And then we respond emotionally to that by mourning and feeling and evidencing our brokenness in a sense of mourning in a a spirit of contrition, which all adds up to you and I being in a place of meekness before the cross, bowed low, humbled by our own sin, and then humbled by the thought that the sinless, spotless Son of God did not hold on to his glory, but added humanity to his deity, left heaven, came to earth, so that he might indeed die on a cross for you and for me. There's only one response to that, prostration, humility, meekness. The man who knows his sin and sees himself as a sinner is marked by lowliness. Paul's a great example, right? He says two things about himself in his 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, I'm the chief of sinners. Now, whether he was, that's not the point. To himself, he could see no one worse than himself. I'm the chief of sinners. Oh, no, I'm the chief. No, well, fight over it. I am. Because I know my heart. Every ugly thought, every action that was generated by a self-will in opposition to God's glory, I know it. And I, I, I'm humbled by it. And, and the result, even on the other side of grace, I'm the least of the saints. Ephesians 3, verse 8. There's no pretension on the part of Paul. Gifted as he was, the leader that he was, chief of sinners, least among the saints. That's poverty of spirit. That's mourning over sin. That's meekness. The poor in spirit and the meek let others say of them what they know to be true of themselves. It's hard to insult someone who knows their own wretchedness. Back to Lloyd-Jones's quote earlier, the man who is truly meek is the man who is amazed that God and man can think of him as well as they do and treat him as well as they do because we know ourselves best. 
and we know that God knows us more than we know ourselves. And therefore, there's a poverty of spirit and there's a mourning and there's a meekness. So it's, a, it's a meekness that showed up in the life of William Carey. Maybe not a name familiar to you, an older saint of God. He was, he's known as the father of modern missions. He was an English Baptist who looked at the church that had become insular and inward-looking and had forgot the Great Commission. And so he restarted world missions for churches in the West and certainly in the British Isles. And he, he ends up heading off to India, leaving behind his, his life in England where he was for many years a cobbler. In fact, it's reported that during his time in India, he translated the Bible in portion into 24 Indian dialects. And when he got there, the Indians didn't like him, and the British didn't want him there. So he faced a lot of dislike and contempt. And one night it showed up at a, at a dinner party among some of the, the British leadership in India. And someone tried to kind of humiliate him in that kind of snarky, sniggering manner where they said, I suppose, Mr. Carey, you once worked as a shoemaker. To which Carey responded, No, your lordship, not a shoemaker, just a cobbler. He, was, he didn't see himself as a shoemaker because the cobbler tended to repair shoes rather than make them up. You're not going to offend me. I'm just a cobbler here on mission, a sinner saved by God's grace. It's hard to fall when you're bowed low. And that's what's going on in William Carey's mind here. You've got contrition, secondly, you've got connection. That is, staying close to Jesus. Let, let's go to Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 to 20, 30, which I, I mentioned early, and, and read it and just pick up a thought. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke, for it is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus is telling us to come under his yoke, a yoke which he bore himself. And if you and I come under his yoke, we will learn of him. And what will we learn of the incarnate Son of God? We will learn humility and meekness. We will learn to submit to God's will when we want to have our own way. We will learn to absorb hurt and insult like he did and forgive our enemies. We will learn humility and meekness as we see God in human form. He who made all things, made flesh and dwelling among us. See, the, the yoke was a, was a a wooden apparatus, and often it was used of two oxen. They would pull a plow or pull a wagon, and often they paired an older ox with a younger ox, so that the o- older ox would teach the younger ox to live under the yoke, at what pace to walk, and, and, and to respond to the master's voice. And Jesus said, hey, come under my yoke, and I'll show you humility and I'll, I'll show you your meekness. Meekness is cultivated by submitting to the one who submitted himself humbly to the will of God to the point of a cross. In fact, it's kind of the reverse, isn't it, of um, Proverbs 22. Write it down, 24 to 25. I'll read it for you. But in that passage, uh, we're told... Um, Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man. Do not go lest you learn his ways. Well, the opposite's true. You want to learn humility? Well, hang out with Jesus. Read his word, learn his gospel, talk to him in prayer, and he'll show you how to respond in a meek manner. He'll show you how to trust God. He'll show you how to commit your way to the Lord. He'll teach you how to delight in God's will. A while back, I was reading a biography 
on Elizabeth Elliot. One of my daughters had recommended it to me, and it was a, a great read. It's a, by a lady called, a writer called Vaughn. I think the book's called Becoming Elizabeth Elliot. If you know something of her story, her husband and Jim lost his life reaching an unreached tribe in Ecuador, the Aka Indians, and he was speared through by those people. And, and, and the story is about Elizabeth along with Rachel Saint, who was Nate, Nate Saint's sister, who also perished with Jim. Both of them were trying to go back and reach that people group. And in the book, there comes a point of tension between Elizabeth and Rachel. They were working on um, learning that language and that culture, and Elizabeth felt she had a lot to contribute, but she was kind of shut out. And it hurt her and disappointed her, and at some point it made her reasonably angry about the whole thing. And in the book, you read these words, meditating on all this, Betty, that's Elizabeth, wrote in her journal about Matthew eleven twenty eight. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. The Summer Institute of Linguistics problem is a good yoke through which to learn meekness and lowliness of heart, she said, by leaving it entirely to him. This is the only way to find rest. So you get this moment of frustration with a sister in the Lord, but the missionary organization that cannot, is not looking her help when they should have looked for her help and input. And you know how she handles it? By remembering that Jesus surrendered himself to trying circumstances. Who had to deal with bad actors or tough situations, and he submitted to that, and he handled it with grace, and so should we. He, uh, we. Thirdly and finally, cooperation, right? Contrition, poverty of spirit, mourning over sin leaves you at a state of meekness. Connection, staying close to Jesus who can teach us humility. And in cooperation with the Spirit of God who will empower us to be meek. You and I cannot self-will meekness. It's a fruit of a daily an hourly reliance upon the help of the Holy Spirit, right? It's a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, verse 23. It's a present imperative. It's you and I are, uh, sorry, we're, we're to, in, if that fruit is to be cultivated in our life, it's cultivated by what? Galatians 5, 16, by us walking in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 18, being led by the Spirit. That's a present imperative. It's an ongoing dependence upon the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's a recognition that if we're to be this, if this is to take place in our lives, He must produce it. Meekness is a fruit that can't be manufactured. It can only be cultivated. Meekness comes in our life as we yield our life to the Spirit within who, by the way, is the Spirit of Jesus, the humble Christ. So it's the Spirit of Jesus takes hold of our life and we surrender to Him and walk in His way, then the Spirit of the Christ He represents will be cultivated in us. Bible Knowledge Commentary puts it like this, the Spirit does not operate automatically in the believer's heart. He waits to be depended upon. When a Christian does not yield to the Spirit's control, the promise is that we w he will not otherwise gratify or complete the desires of a sinful flesh. When you and I yield to the Spirit's control, we won't fulfill the flesh. We'll be loving, we'll be patient, we'll be faithful, we'll be meek. He waits to be depended upon. In fact, I like the way John J.I. Packer translates walk in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. So as you and I walk through life, we've got to consciously, deliberately bring ourselves to rely upon the Spirit through prayer and the Word and church fellowship. They're the means by which He will 
influence us and, and, and press upon us the need for change, or he will give us what's necessary for a proper response. Keep in step with the Spirit, are you? See, when you're walking by yourself, that's one thing. When you're walking with another person, that's a different thing. Um, how can two walk together except they be agreed? When you walk with another person, you kind of have to adjust to that person you're walking with. Uh, the other day, um, I'd, I'd kind of get up early and worked hard, and I, I wanted a break, and I'd been sitting a lot, so I felt I needed to do a little bit of exercise. So I jumped in the car and took the 22-minute drive down to Balboa Island, parked the car, and I walked the island twice. And I did it at a good clip. Wanted my heart rate up, wanted to sweat a little, wanted to just, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, work my body. And I did that and enjoyed it and wanted to do it again. In fact, when you do that, you remind yourself, why don't I do this more often? We've got so much beauty around us, and yet we just kind of head down, get on with life. But when I walk Balboa with June, it's altogether different. Um, June doesn't walk as fast as I do. As a police officer for six years, did a lot of foot patrols, so I'm, 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 I walk at a good clip. Jin, not so much. I'll just leave it at that. And so before long, we're like, uh, you know, a quarter of a mile into our walk, and she'll say, it's not the Olympics. <laughs> or she'll say, you're not on patrol with the RUC. Come on back here, buddy. And, and uh, you know, and I'll start to slow down, and I'll adjust my pace to walk with her. I want to sweat. She wants to talk. She wants to point out every flower in every house in Balboa. She'll point the windows and the decorations, and I'm going, Lord, help me. <laughs> but the point is this. It's one thing when you're walking by yourself. It's another thing when you're walking with someone else. When you're walking with someone else, that will require adjustment. And my friend, we're told to walk in the Spirit. We're told to keep in step with the Spirit, which means we listen to His voice in Scripture, which means we pray in the knowledge that He is praying with us and for us. We walk in step with the Spirit, and we repent of and reject those things we know that grieve Him. We adjust our lifestyle and we adjust our attitudes to those things that please him. Because you see, we once walked according to the world. We once did our own thing. Walked in any direction and in any way we wanted and those days are no longer. Finally, the mercy. Not going to spend a lot of time here. But you know from our opening study on the Beatitudes and the Sermon of Mind, every one of these Beatitudes is couched in the language of a blessing and comes with a promise. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The blessing is that theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The blessing is they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The blessing is that someday the meek, the humble child of God, living Jesus' way and walking Calvary's road, they, and only they, will inherit the earth. Isn't that a staggering question or a staggering promise? Someday you and I, along with the people of God, will inherit the whole planet. Make sure that idea is in your portfolio. Make sure that you leave today feeling a little richer than when you come in. Someday, I believe it's future, you and I will inherit the earth when Jesus takes this planet back, when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and Savior 
the world believes the meek never get anywhere, but we don't. We believe we will inherit the earth. Margaret Thatcher famously said that I can be extraordinarily patient so long as I get my way in the end. And so can we. We can be extraordinarily patient. We can forgive our enemies. We can treat people who are unkind to us with kindness. We can look past the prosperity of the wicked because we know in the end Jesus will have his way. And we're going to ride his coattails into the kingdom that he's going to establish. There's a great reversal coming. Anybody say amen to that? There's a great reversal coming. You know, they talk today about a global reset. I agree with them. I just don't agree on the means. It's not going to be the World Economic Forum. It's not going to be the European Union. It's not going to be the United States or a combination of allies. It's not going to be China in the east, and it's going to be Russia in the north. It's going to be the king from above who will come and who will establish his kingdom at his appearing, Second Timothy 4, verse 1. In fact, Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount, pray thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as is done in heaven. That's not true at this moment. God's will is not being done on earth as it's being done in heaven, but it will be. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. God's got a plan that's unfolding. Things aren't falling out, out, uh, uh, apart. They're falling into place. And all things are working together for the good of God's people. Just as the Jew inherited the land promised them through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so the child of God in a future day will inherit the earth. I believe this embraces two things very quickly. The millennial kingdom and the new heaven and the new earth. Where do I get that? Well, quickly jump over to Revelation 20, 21, and 22, where you have uh, Jesus having returned in this present world, will reign for 1,000 years. He will fulfill his promises to Israel. He will bring his enemies under his feet, and he will, at the Father's behest, be exalted before the nations that rejected him when every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And and of all that time, we read about it in Revelation 20, verse 4, and I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. You and I are going to be part of that, part of that administration that's inaugurated when the king appears, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 is the critical premillennial text because it talks about the return of Jesus and his appearing and his kingdom. The kingdom comes when the king comes. It's here in partial hidden form, but someday it will be total and it will be public. And then when that thousand years is over and Jesus has been vindicated and the devil has been dealt with within history, it'll all come to an end. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And according to Revelation 21, verse 7, you and I will be part of that. He who overcomes shall inherit it all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. You go to Revelation 22, verse 5, there should be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light, nor sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever. I've traveled quite a bit. Maybe you have too. Wherever you've been, whatever you've seen, someday it will be ours. If it's good and it's righteous and it's within God's unspoiled creation. God's not finished with this world. A revolution is still ahead that will be bigger, bolder, better than the French, American, and Russian revolutions combined. 
There's going to be a great reversal, a great reset. God will triumph over Satan. Good will triumph over evil. Israel will triumph over the nations. The church will triumph over the world, and the righteous will triumph over the wicked. The lowly will be exalted. The forgotten will be remembered. The obedient will be rewarded and the suffering will be comforted. In one of his last books in the subject of Hope, Lewis Smeads tells how the great civil rights leader Martin Luther King kept hope alive for millions of African Americans amidst the degradation, individual abuse, and institutional racism they faced. He did this by setting the sights of his followers on a better day. He helped them imagine a land where people were not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. On August 28, 1963, King gathered a quarter of a million people at the Lincoln Memorial Monument in Washington to appeal to the conscience of the nation. The country was at boiling point, and so the authorities behind the scenes had counseled him to keep his rhetoric cool. Dr. King had agreed and proceeded to give a rather tame speech by his measurement, designed to turn the temperature down. The story goes, according to Smeads, that the gospel singer Mahalia Jackson, who my father listened to almost every Sunday afternoon, was sitting behind the great leader, and was beginning to become agitated at the flat tone. And as the great civil rights leader wrapped up his speech and was about to sit down, she shouted, Martin! The dream, Martin! The dream! Tell him about the dream! Tell him about the dream! At that precise moment, Dr. King launched those famous words. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Don't you forget the dream sent to you by John the Apostle that there's coming a day when we will reign with Christ the church that's been overlooked, persecuted, lost amidst the nations, will be exalted. And those who are the meek followers of the humble Savior will inherit the earth. Don't forget the dream. Don't forget the dream. Father, we thank you for our time in the Word. Thank you for reminding us of the antithetical nature of this sermon. This this virtue, this, this way of living, this kingdom attitude is non gratis in this culture. Cool. This is not a virtue extolled, it's not taught in our schools. It's not modeled by our politicians. It's not in the coaching manual of a coach. But we are being reminded that um, God opposes the pride and exalts the humble. This is the Jesus way because he modeled it. This is the lifestyle of a man and a woman who's poor in spirit, contrite and mourning over sin, and are meek as a result. Lord, help us to stay close to you. Help us to keep in step with the Spirit. Help us not to be conformed to this world, but to be renewed in our mind, that we may prove what is that good and pleasurable will of God. Lord, we know that we will come out 
on top as we live beneath the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.